Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Derek Young. And we are here because the Wildcats are getting ready for another conference showdown this weekend. Possibly the easiest game that they're going to get in the Big 12 this season. Oklahoma State at home. This is a game that, as you look at the standings right now, K-State is tied at the top. They are 3-1 and one with Baylor, Texas Tech, and Kansas. If you are going to keep pace with them and then the other teams chasing right there at 2-2, two and two, you have to win your home game against Oklahoma State because they are, without a doubt right now, the worst team in the Big 12. The only issue is, and I alluded to this in our power rankings this week, uh, right when we started saying that Oklahoma State was the worst team in football this year, they beat K-State and flipped their season around. I don't think that will be the case for the basketball team on Saturday night in Manhattan, but we shall see. This is another game that, for K-State, they've already had a couple of them, UCF and West Virginia this year. It's much more about what K-State does in this game than what Oklahoma State can do or will do because as everybody else that has played Oklahoma State to this point has found out, they've been able to overcome whatever deficiencies they may have had to get a win. Baylor was probably the team that struggled the most with them. They went to overtime in Stillwater to start Big 12 play, but they ultimately figured out they overcame a bad shooting night to beat Oklahoma State. For K-State, they already shoot it poorly, but they defend better than anybody in the Big 12 right now, and that could make life pretty miserable on Oklahoma State, who is short of scoring options. They only have two guys in double figures, and really it just comes down to Javon Small and Bryce Thompson for their offense on most nights. So uh, that is the generic intro to Oklahoma State and K-State. Uh, we'll, we'll just we'll talk about K-State here because I, I, we don't need to go too terribly in depth on Oklahoma State. We'll mention it in a little bit, but like I said, this is more about K-State. So, D.Y., uh, what's the expectation, and what do you need to see from the Cats on Saturday to get to 4-1 and one in Big 12 play? Yeah, it'll be interesting. Uh, Oklahoma State can make shots, uh, but they turn it over almost as much as Kansas State. So hopefully we don't see a turnover-ridden game because that there is potential for that. But you'd like to see your, your turnovers improve, right? Um, you, I forget what the total number ended up being. I know they corrected it in basically the last 10 minutes and into overtime. But you're not going to turn over that many times and beat Baylor. Um, so they got away with that. So, and I think, look, Kansas State's not making a ton of shots this year. I get that. The numbers are, are kind of, eh, especially the three point percentage I'm looking at, it's 272nd in the country. Uh, some of that is because of Tyler Perry, right? We expected him to be a much better three point shooter. Some of that's because of Cam Carter over time. He has proven to be a much better three point shooter. I think what's contributing to their, woes uh in that department are that cam carter is expending in like probably 99.9 percent .9 of his energy on defense and that can affect your legs on offense when you're trying to shoot and tyler perry uh for the first time in his career is is basically an exclusively a point guard and he's doing it for 35 to 40 minutes a night and that can be both mentally and physically grueling as well so I, I think this offense is probably a little bit better than what it has looked in recent weeks. And they're probably due, you know how everyone says you're due for some regression. And that's certainly what we saw from Baylor in the first, what, four games here from the three point line after having basically a record setting pace throughout the non conference portion of their schedule. On the reverse, I think Kansas State's due for what do you call it, progression, I guess, because. Their, their offense is better than what it has looked. They've missed some open looks from guys that typically don't miss those open looks. And as long as they clean up some of the turnovers, I, I just – I don't – it's kind of one of those things where you have nowhere to go but up, which is probably true. But I still think there is upside to this offense. Yeah, I mean, K-State is, is turning the ball over at a very, very high number right now. Uh, in, in Big 12 play alone, they're turning it over on 22.5% of their possessions, which is the worst in the league. Oklahoma State, they are also over 20% in that category. They are 10th in the Big 12 uh, in conference play, only in terms of how much they turn the ball over. And they have the worst offense and worst defense in Big 12 play, which shouldn't come as a surprise because – 
Uh, they have lost all their games in blowout fashion, except for the game against Baylor where they took them to overtime. And that only happened because Baylor shot as poorly as they have all season. I think in regulation, Baylor only made one three in that game. Um, that's the one positive for K-State where I mean, you talk about regression versus progression. I, I think there is like legitimate progress being made on the shooting front for K-State. In their four Big 12 games total, they are shooting 36% from three. It's just we've seen some really ugly performances against West Virginia and Baylor in that regard. But we talked about it after the game on Tuesday night. K-State's defending so well that they are making teams shoot like K-State is, if not worse, and and that's something that can make up for when you're not scoring or making some of the shots that you think you should because, I mean, K-State is shooting it well, but I think we know that some of that is from just a quick, hot stretch. You'd almost rather K-State be able to knock down more of the open shots consistently throughout the game. I'm certainly not going to turn away the the hot streaks that they've had from Tyler Perry against Texas Tech and UCF, but you want to see a guy like Cam Carter, who's only shooting 30% from three this season, be able to knock down the open looks he gets. Uh, and I think that's probably the next step for K-State. Once they start to get uh, consistent shot making from the outside, even just a few more a game from Perry and Carter, that's going to elevate this team even more than what we've already seen in Big 12 play because I think it's pretty easy to say that this team is far better than the one that we saw play against Nebraska a couple weeks ago. Although the one area where K-State is still struggling uh, defensively is they're giving up a ton of offensive rebounds right now. And K-State themselves had been good at that. Now they got to figure out how to limit that. And maybe some of it is they're just giving up so many missed shots that and so many bad ones that you're just getting bad bounces. I think that's a part of offensive rebounding is missing shots so poorly that you get it. But that's something to, to look at for the Cats. Yeah, if you were going to pick one flaw on the defensive side that needs corrected, it's, it's preventing the offensive rebounds for the opponent. And if you want to, per, you know, harp in on one flaw on the offensive side, look, the shots are the open shots at some point are going to fall. At least I'm stubbornly in that belief. So if if there's a problem on offense, it's more so the turnovers because you're just taking away chances. There's a reason why Baylor shot 22 more times, and it was the offensive rebounds by Baylor and the turnovers by Kansas State. Like, those things just really make it hard. You know, there's – you know, I think Fan talks about the four or five factors every time, and obviously offensive rebounds matter and turnovers matter. But those two almost matter even more if they're both the problem because then you're just getting up a lot less shots than your opponent. You know, look at what Oklahoma State does, though. You, we're talking about matchups here, and you, you wonder if – Two things. There's two sides to this coin. One, I wonder if Oklahoma State's do just for an impressive game because they've been pretty brutal and they've also had bad luck when it comes to the travel schedule that likely mm -hmm. impacted some of their performance. But like I just said, Kansas State struggles to keep teams off the offensive glass. Oklahoma State, pretty average at getting offensive rebounds. Kansas State turns it over just as almost as more than anyone in the country right now. You talk about the Big 12 only numbers in general. It's about 21% for the season, which is 333rd in the country. Look, there's not many more teams in college basketball division one than 333. So uh, they're beating about everyone there. But, you know, look what Oklahoma State does. They're 305th in forcing turnovers. So two things that Kansas State really does badly aren't necessarily things that Oklahoma State takes advantage of. And, and we talk about Oklahoma State's actually making shots. I mean, they're top 100 in effective field goal percentage, two-point percentage, three-point percentage. It's like, if those are your numbers, how are you the worst offense in the Big 12 if you're, yeah. three, if you're top 100 in basically every single shooting number? Well, it's the things I said. <laughs> like K-State, they're turning it over way too much. They're not getting offensive rebounds, and they're not getting to the free throw line. So they're yeah. basically one and done about every trip or zero and done every trip because they're turning it over and they're not getting free throws. Like Kansas State, yeah, not shooting well, right? Oklahoma State is shooting well. Kansas State's not. Kansas State has a better offense. Why? Because Kansas State's getting more shots because they are rebounding their own misses. And Kansas State is one of the best in the country right now at getting to the free throw line. And uh, this is to add on top of Oklahoma State's struggles with getting to the free throw line. When they get there, they're only shooting 66% this season. That's that's one of the worst in the country. 
Yeah. And you can't have that. That's where, look, Oklahoma State, most people probably look at them and think, oh, okay, this is the same type of Oklahoma State team. They're not very good, and they're going to brick every shot they throw up. They've actually shot it pretty well percentage-wise from the outside this season. But the one area that is still very reflective of them not being a, a good shooting team and a bunch of bricklayers like Mike Boynton is accustomed to is at the free throw line. Now, they haven't been as good shooting the basketball in Big 12 play. Honestly, kind of similar to Baylor in that regard. Baylor had a really impressive non-con shooting it, and they've struggled in the Big 12. Credit to K-State, they made them struggle even more in that game. And that's one of those spots where Baylor has guys on their team that they're comfortable settling for bad or contested shots, and we saw that on, on Tuesday. I think they felt a little bit of desperation. Oklahoma State has some of that in them, too, with the way that their guys are going to go out and play. So, I mean, th this is why all of this is just one of those big deals for K-State where it's about what you go out and do and how you're going to make it happen. And Oklahoma State is not a team that is going to force a ton of turnovers. Like, K-State... This is a this is a good opportunity for them to prove that they can kind of tone it down a bit because you're not playing a defense that is as tight and stringent as what you've seen from you know Baylor at times can crank it up but they struggle this year there were a lot of giveaways there Texas Tech fairly physical but K State helped them out there like th I think the number one thing for K State to do is to go out and just play smart in this game against Oklahoma State if you play smart and you start fast you're not going to have an issue with taking down the Cowboys. Yeah, I mean, you got you kind of look at this matchup. I'll probably anticipate a tight game nonetheless, just because Kansas State's coming off a pretty monumental, massive win, and Oklahoma State is due for some progression in terms of their performance or at least outcome. But, man, you look at, like, these numbers and the – you it, it look, you probably could, but – find a worse matchup, but it might be tough. Like, because everything that Kansas State, what what everything that has hurt Kansas State this year, Oklahoma State is not necessarily assembled to take advantage of. Yeah. We talked about it, like you know, the turnovers, the offensive rebounds. I mean, Oklahoma State just doesn't do those things. Then on the other side, it's like, well, Oklahoma State, not, not bad shooting, but – Everything else, eh, it's like, well, Kansas State's like lights out on defense. And just and if you can't get to the free throw line, you can't rebound. If Kansas State defends your first shot well, which they have done all year, what are you going to do? I don't yeah. I don't know. That That's where you get to. Because you talked about Oklahoma State being a terrible free throw shooting team. Well, they're also 263rd at getting to the line. And Kansas State's one of the best teams in the country keeping teams off the line. Yeah, Kansas State will allow offensive rebounds, but Oklahoma State doesn't get them. Um, and Oklahoma State – you know, some they turn it over a bunch, and Kansas State kind of turns teams over. Uh, Kansas State turns it over a bunch, but Oklahoma State doesn't turn teams over. I mean, a mm -hmm. lot of these numbers, even where Oklahoma State is good and has the advantage, it's like barely, like to where it's negligible difference. So I'll probably pick a tight game, but, man, you look up and down the important numbers, it's like, man, this actually, especially with the being a very much call of steam, has a recipe to be a blowout. So, yeah, I, 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 but I just, I'm not bold enough to do that. I, another thing is, you know, I get these numbers from fan every week and, and I think a lot for that, obviously, but boy, Kansas state's defense, we've talked about how good it is, but we still might not be doing it justice because there's about eight important numbers and it's points per, per possession, effective field goal percentage, turnover rate, free throw rate, offensive rebounding rate, two-point percentage, three-point percentage, and three-point rate, right? Kansas State's top 25 and a half of those. Top 25 in the entire country. Mm -hmm. Look, K-State has has put themselves in a, a really nice spot uh, over the last couple of weeks. With I mean, the defense, hit, we saw signs of it starting to kind of come together. They've really upped it, and, and that's been a big deal. I mean, if, I think if you go and look at Ken Palm and defensive efficiency – Last night, K-State was up to 23rd. Maybe that's changed a little bit one way or the other. But this team is defending like one of the best in the country right now. And it's a legitimate asset that they have uh, that they can use to their advantage at this point. So they're going to defend well. It's going to force Oklahoma State to do some things that they don't want to. The one other thing that I'll add to this is Oklahoma State, in terms of what their rotation is going to look like, K-State, this is yet another game where the Cats are going to have a size advantage. And this is where 
you have a chance to make up for it because against Texas Tech, they didn't really take advantage of it. David Gasson and Will McNair kind of struggled in that game. They didn't provide a ton of help to you. But O State's really only going to play one guy that stands at 6'11". Everybody else is 6'8 or shorter. They might every once in a while throw Mike Marsh out there, but his minutes have continued to de decrease since non-conference play ended. So this is another game where K-State's going to have a size advantage, and it's just about can you actually make it an advantage for you, or does Oklahoma State find a way to kind of abuse you by going with a smaller, quicker lineup? Yeah, yeah. And it, it'll be interesting like if, if Jarrell Colbert continues to get minutes because they yeah. want to uh, make sure that Will McNair is fresher at the end of games because – well, if they played all those minutes at Lubbock, seemed to wear down a little bit. You could say the same thing for Tyler Perry, I thought, as well. Tyler, you really didn't have a choice with Tyler Perry against Baylor. You play those minutes and we lose, right? Uh, we have no other point guard. So, you know, you're you're going to have to suck it up. And he did. That's why I've been writing really good things about Tyler Perry. Uh, but the amount of stuff that they're asking of him, like he's probably catching too much flack. I think everyone's starting to come around to that. It's like, all right, yeah, like this guy is – he's holding this team together – with his with basically his hands tied behind his back and he deserves a lot of credit for that but i thought will mcnair played huge minutes in overtime after not mm -hmm. being particularly great yeah, he wasn't very good early in the game yeah. or most of the game yeah but man he was great in overtime against baylor and i thought that was probably a product of jarell Corbin being able to provide yeah. really good minutes throughout that game and give mcnair the needed rest so that he can be productive at the end of games i think that's huge so let's we'll see if We'll see if Jerome Tang continues to trust Jarrell Colbert and give him those minutes because I think it makes Kansas State a better team overall because then you have a good McNair at the end of games as well. Um, well it'll be interesting if, you know, R.J. Jones hasn't played yeah. a ton in the last few few games. I ask you last, about that. Last month or so, he has a few good minutes. He didn't play a ton. It was just no. really good, really good four or five minutes. Um, I think off the top of my head, it's what it felt like, but it'll be interesting if, if that happens again because – if Dada Ains is available, Dada Ains has to play because he's your other ball handler. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. I would like to see at least a little bit of R.J. Jones in this game and to see what you can do because, I mean, yeah, shots sometimes just go in when you put them up, but a guy that can hit that shot, you know, with some defense in his face in overtime, it was crucial. They needed the three. This team needs shooting, and if somebody can provide it, I think you got to experiment at least a little bit this would seem to be a pretty good game for you to kind of get that opportunity to do it. You don't need to be, you would think, going at the same level that you needed to beat Baylor or you know battle with Texas Tech. So this is a good opportunity to, to kind of find, again, more depth. We saw it develop at different points this year, like against West Virginia, and then you know some flashes against Baylor, like you mentioned. I think this is another good opportunity to see if you've got guys that can find their way onto the floor a little bit more and get some dudes rest at some point along the way. Because I'm with you. I think the Colbert minutes were massive for Will McNair to be able to have any juice to recover from a really shaky performance in regulation to be important and good in overtime in any facet that they needed him. Yeah, and and haven't touched on him, but I think both deserved and earned at this point and warranted Dorian Finister is basically yeah. your sixth man. Yeah, wild. Never would have expected it, but the minutes he's given K-State right now, they are they're impressive and the the good news is for him too like he's not coming in and trying to just, you know, throw up Sean Neal Williams or Ron Freeman like shots. Yeah, he's, he's not trying he's to playing within the team and doing what he needs to do and then when called upon to make a play, he is doing it by finishing lobs. I did not anticipate and, uh, Dorian Finister to play like the Blake Griffin of K-State. Yeah, well, I mean, he just hustles more than anyone. He works harder than anyone. And that's on the floor, and that's his own guys and the opponent. You know, he got behind everybody on that alley oop. He even outran the guys that began on him. He just plays harder than everyone. So it's earned, it's deserved. And what what's really encouraging, and I know it's baby steps, but it seems like he he does. It's you could see like the growth and development from mm -hmm. game to game. Like it's like. When it started, it's like, okay, he just hustles and got loose balls. And then the next team, it's like, well, he he hustles and got loose balls, but now he's rebounding. The next team's like, well, he just hustles, get loose balls, rebounding, and now he's a weapon on the fast break. Yeah. And then and then he took all that. And the next game, it's like, well, now he's making the, the right pass, and he's showing a confident jumper. He didn't make it, but that looked good, really, from the corner. I thought he was going to make it at mm -hmm. one point. 
it was the same shot that RJ Jones got. So it's like he adds a little bit to his game each time out without any regression. It's really a good thing to see. So it's like you could tell like the coaching staff just perfectly just bring him along and developing. It's like, okay, now you can do this. Let's try this. You know, it, it's been a perfect experiment. He is the embodiment of the like five year old basketball coach, uh, given you know the speech to the team is like play hard, play smart, have fun. That is Dorian Finister right now, and I mean it's it's getting him minutes and it's turned him into at this current point a valuable part of K State's rotation, which I'm not sure they even would have anticipated this season because I mean he he was going games where he wasn't even playing for him in the non con, but. It just goes to show that if, if you go out there and you have the right mindset and you can do the right things, you're going to continue to play. I mean, it's it's why we see guys that, you know, probably don't have the athleticism to play Big 12 football thrive, you know, once under Bill Snyder and then again under Chris Kleiman. Like, they just want guys that know how to play and can figure it out for their team and lead. And, and Dorian Finister has found a way to do that by the way he's played. So, uh, he's been a, a massive revelation for K-State this season. So they get the Cowboys this weekend in Bramlage. Before we get out of here, give me your prediction and MVPs for the game, D.Y. Yeah, I mean, Oklahoma State's 0-7 against the quad one and quad two. So if they were to win this, it'd be by far their, their best win of the year. Um, the 0-7 combined in the quad one and quad two games, it, it would be worse than the Nebraska loss at this point if they were to fall to Oklahoma State at home. Yeah. I hate that Oklahoma State is is kind of due for a good game. That's why it's like when you look at the stats and put them next to each other, it's like, man, this kind of screams double digit win for Kansas State. But I just, I, I think I'm just trained to know that life in the Big Twelve is never that easy. And when you do get the blowouts, it's typically surprisingly right. Like no one expected, Kansas, yeah. like West Virginia is not good, but no one expected Kansas State to blow out West Virginia and Morgantown. Um, I think maybe you expected it from to blow out UCF, but maybe not in the fashion by being up by 35 mm -hmm. in the second half. So um, now that you're expecting it, it's probably not going to happen. So I I think it's a big game from Tyler Perry. I know we're probably just baking on the law of averages at some point. It's going to be a big game, but I like what I'm seeing. It feels like a good mojo. Like Perry is being almost more transparent and outward about his emotions and what has been dragging him down. I think – He's like admitting to, or, you know, telling, opening himself up to everyone. It's like, I've been in my own head. It's It's been tough emotionally trying to adjust to probably new competition, a new environment, a new position, a new role. And at, and at some point, it's all going to collaborate and he's going to explode. And I think we're on the cusp of that because of how he's opening himself up so much more because that tells me he's starting to get more comfortable on both his own skin, but also in Manhattan at Kansas State in that locker room mm -hmm. with those coaches, with those teammates. And I love how they're starting to rally around him. Like they're defending him whenever possible. I mean, you asked the question about the shooting stuff, and Arthur Kuma's like basically just came in and like that the accountability and the cohesion there and, and just Kaluma's just decision where he 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 wanted to speak up. I mean, I don't even think we saw that last year. And we saw some of the best leaders in the, the country with Marquise Noel and Keontae Johnson. Just strikes me as a really solid thing. So I I think Tyler Perry carries them and they beat Oklahoma State. I think they, they score a little bit more than we're probably accustomed to seeing and have a good offensive day. Uh and, and maybe Oklahoma State keeps up because they're due for a good game too. I like Kansas State 79-73. Okay, uh, you're going. You're going high score. I'm going to take the Cats, 69 to 55, and I'm going to lean on Cam Carter uh, in in this game because I think more so than even Tyler Perry's. Because I'm not overly worried about Tyler Perry. He's going to find games where he still pours it in for K State. I I want to see more consistency from Cam Carter's outside shot because I think that's kind of the crucial thing. And over the last two games you've gotten kind of what I want out of Cam Carter. He, he In the last two, he's 5 of 10 from 3, uh, 2 of 5 against Baylor, 3 of 5 against Tech. Obviously, 50% is a lot to ask. But if you can have those games where you just hit a couple uh, and, and make it significant, be efficient, do all that, that's good. The one thing that Cam needs to turn out, he turned the ball over seven times, and he really struggled uh, in See, the first thanks. half. And really, that's kind of been a, a theme for Cam Carter. He's He had a bad first half against West Virginia, and then kind of recovered and had a great second half. 
he's probably a guy that uh, un- under the radar needs to go out and have a pretty solid half to half consistent game. His his problem has been the turnovers and the the two point shots. I, I think yeah. he has a hard time with decision making every now and then. But yeah. put him on the left wing and he'll never miss a shot. So yeah. Uh, I will also say this in terms of being concerned about Oklahoma State and what they might do to K-State here. I went and looked last year at the two teams that finished at the bottom of the Big 12, uh, Oklahoma and Texas Tech. They were 5-13. and 13. Those teams, they struggled out of the gate like most do, but they didn't get blown out like Oklahoma State is. They, they were competitive in all of their games. I think Oklahoma, their first five games last season were all decided by five points or less. Uh, Texas Tech, similar deal. They were competing with everybody early on. Like, I think if Oklahoma State was going to be legit, we would have seen more life out of them. I know the travel thing is an aspect to this, but you know, you didn't have to travel very far to play Kansas on on Tuesday night. And we know that this KU team isn't as good as past years. They're still good. They're still relative to everybody else in the country, better than them. But I, I just don't think that this is a team that right now outside of getting the, the weird basketball night where everything's falling for you and it's all going your way, and then you know K-State turning it over like 25 times, uh, K-State should be able to win this game. So that's why I went 69-55. I think, I think it's probably a little bit more rock fighty than uh, what people would like, but I think the Cats get a double-digit win, and that's probably all that matters to everybody. Yeah, I just have – I don't know why, why, why I'm a little paranoid, but I, I, I do have that a little bit. It's um, tough when you see a team be 0-4 and, and just think that, like, it, this is the Big 12. They're Not since TCU joined the league are teams this bad. Yeah. Um, and like you said, there are nights where, you know, you just – the ball bounces your way. <laughs> Everything goes in for you. Nothing goes in for the other team, regardless of performance. But typically <laughs> – excuse me. But typically – that doesn't happen on the road either. Yeah, very true. We'll see how it goes and uh, how the Wildcats fare, but they've got an opportunity to get to four and one in league play through the first five games. That the would be pretty first. massive. Yeah, women, women play first. I guess KU. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, so Sunflower Showdown at one, and then Cats and Pokes at six tomorrow night in Bramlage. Uh, Going to be a full day of basketball in the Little Apple and should and- be exciting. And top five might might be on the table for the women because yeah. I think I saw where there's two two teams in front of them that are playing against one another and another that's already lost this week. Can't say it had the TCU forfeit. So top five might be on the table, but you know, KU wants this, you know, big rivalry game. And they're they already beat Baylor, so they are dangerous. They've just been probably, you know, I don't know women's basketball a whole lot. But if you kind of look at what preseason expectations were, the rankings, and what team what teams have done up to this point, KU's actually been one of the more dis- disappointing clubs in women's basketball in the Big Twelve. Yeah, yeah, they were they were the WNIT champs last year, and they've kind of struggled out of the gates. But the Baylor win was an eye opener, so I would imagine that the K State women are ready to go. And yeah, NC State lost last night, so they were the number four team, and then UCLA and Colorado play tonight. That's three versus five, so. Uh, there is going to be the opportunity there for some movement if the Wildcats are able to take care of business at home against KU tomorrow. And then on uh, on Sunday, Colorado has to play number six USC. So not an easy w- weekend for the uh, the Buffaloes, and, and that might provide an opportunity for Jeff Mitty's squad. So I I actually saw them uh, play and beat LSU in Vegas yeah. because they played right before K State. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Uh, the Wildcats, you would think, come out. 2-0 tomorrow, but uh, it's basketball. Anything can happen, so you got to go and take care of your own business. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thank you for watching our preview of the Cats and the Pokes. We will be back, uh, well, I guess Saturday, tomorrow, with plenty of post-game coverage and also loads of stuff going on over at kstateonline.com. So head over to On3 to get all the written content, hit up the message boards as well, be a part of the conversation and uh, discuss whatever you need to over there. Are you, are you wanting to talk about, uh, I'm trying to think of what the hot topic over there is right now, uh, KU Stadium remodel, which I thought the most interesting thing was that their chancellor believes that the Big 12 schedule is for football next year is coming in the next week. So I'm going to hold Brett Yormark to that. Uh, um, and then also plenty of conversation about the Cats over there. And the cyber attack. <laughs> and the cyber attack yes yeah very yeah very much so uh I, some people have been very interested in that 
I'm not even sure my brother, who's a student, knew that it went on. So uh, his social security number is probably out there in the hands of somebody that took it over the week. But uh, he doesn't have much to his name to be worth stealing an identity from at this point. So we are out of here. We'll talk to you tomorrow after the game in Bramlage.